I'd like to welcome you all to the Halftime Talk. I'm delighted today to be joined by Karen Maharishi, who is a monetary economist and author of The India Collective, What is India Really All About? I love that title. Uh, and of course, okay. India is about a lot of things. But today we're going to try and focus on the economic story uh, of, of India. Uh, and, and obviously within that, uh, energy falls into that, of course being one of the world's largest consumers. So thanks very much for joining us, Karen, uh, on Halftime Talk. Thank you very much, Adela, for having me on the show. Great to have you. Today, right. we see the price of oil on the market, at Brent oil today, for example, at $80. But India is getting it at a fairly good discount from Russia, right? right? We've seen right. your volumes from Russia grow uh, month on month last year. Um, yeah. How critical has that discounted oil been to India growth, do you think? Uh, has it been, I mean, would you have coped just as well with higher prices, i.e. the Indian economy would have kept going? How important is the Russian oil discount to India's right. economy today? The current super spike that we are discussing today, as you were mentioning, has occurred since Jan uh, 2022 and has averaged just over $91 per barrel. Now, during this time, Dayala, and an Indian household's income in PPP is roughly $9,000. And the economy has grown again by over 6.2% in real terms. So what this means is that at the rate at which the Indian economy uh, is growing, uh, India's economic activity is simply agnostic to, to, to the oil price levels. Now that an Indian household has a purchasing power almost double to that of 2014 levels, for example, uh, and 80 to 90 dollars per barrel is a non-issue, apart from maybe stoking inflationary fears in the domestic economy in India. Also, given the fact that almost 14 percent of Indian exports come from refined petroleum products, uh, a high oil price, in my opinion, is actually good for the Indian refiners and the overall uh, stability of the Indian macroeconomy. Now, let me now let me come to uh, the Russian uh, situation yeah. here. Uh, I think India probably saved. Uh, uh, a little over three to four billion dollars from the Russian imports, or roughly two to two point two dollars per barrel, uh, when you compare right. it with the with, with the with the international um, oil uh, oil oil markets uh, uh, and how and how crude is traded. Compared to India's total annual imp, uh, oil import bill of nearly one hundred twenty billion dollars, this is this does not seem significant when you look at it in this context. Uh, nevertheless, the reduced landed cost of oil would have added to the government's tax collection, given the fact that in India, imposed taxes on fuels have an inverse relationship with crude prices. What this means is that when crude prices go down, consumer taxes on fuels are increased and vice versa when crude prices go up. Therefore, while the exchequer, uh, exchequer's tax collection would, would have increased uh, during this time, the Indian consumers may not have enjoyed the discounted prices on fuel, uh, as it is led out to believe. Also, we must understand that India and Russia have a long-standing strategic and cultural relationship existing for over 70 years now uh, in terms of the formal uh, sharing uh, uh, relationship when we have embassies in both the countries. For this reason, apart from getting oil at below market rates from Russia, India could have also been obligated, in my opinion, to buy Russian oil to help an old friend. So its relationship with Russia, strong, historical. Its relationship with the West is also strong and historical and entrenched economically. So right. how does India balance those two, uh, given that obviously Russia is at war with the West, if you like? Uh, India seems to be very confidently uh, pursuing an as it has the right to do, an independent uh, policy of how it deals with its foreign relationships. But there seems to be a very big clash there at the moment, doesn't there? So uh, in, uh, so, uh, in this context, uh, Dayala, I think you have to understand how India's foreign policy functions. And, and that is something that uh, is the case uh, since uh, 1947, when India gained independence from Britain. So India's foreign policy is based on the concept of non-alignment uh, approach, which suggests that India does not pick sides as a matter of policy. This also means that India practices a strategic autonomy and wants to have friendly, friendly relations with all major countries in the world. 
Now, what this means is that India will continue to nurture its relationship with Russia, despite the, uh, the, uh, the country drifting towards the United States and being viewed as an American ally. So uh, there is no conflict here. India does not distinguish uh, uh, between uh, its, uh, its relationship with the United States and Russia. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's, it's more of an island approach where you have Russia uh, as, as, uh, as an island uh, in the Indian foreign, foreign policy and, and, and the US uh, on the other hand is another island. Uh, so, uh, so, and, uh, so India is basically navigating uh, in this in this ocean, uh, uh, so to say, uh, and and trying to balance uh, its relationship with both these powers. Yeah. And I suppose as long as those powers are happy with that, then it's it's in a great position. Um, yeah. Let's talk a bit, Karen, about uh, the, the recent or current events, which is so the nervousness in in the global, uh, I suppose, financial markets and debt markets. Uh, you know, we've had a mini banking crisis in America, banks coming to the rescue of the regional banks. That's very far away from India, I know. Right. But just generally in terms of the sort of global uh, picture of, of, of where the global economic growth is going. We've talked about, about India's growth, but even within Asia and, and India's there in that continent, you know, is do you see any ripple effects from uh, the, the, the exposure, let's say, that the West is having economically at the moment, potentially? Or that even that China, at the end of the day, is also emerging from a post-COVID lockdown. Uh, yeah. How is that all impacting, uh, if anything, India's economic planning, uh, if you like? So almost all uh, financial crises that have that have hit Asia have been caused by a hawkish Fed and the resultant capital flight from Asia. The mm. banking crisis in the U.S., as you were mentioning, uh, itself is spawned by a tightening monetary policy, invariably. Uh, and that invari invariably spreads to Asia, not just because of an exposure contagion, but rather, in my view, because of volatility uh, in, in, in both the money and the capital markets. Now, this volatility happens because of panic selling in the capital markets and reserve capital and reserve capital flight to, to safe haven assets, including the USD and gold. Therefore, I think that if the current crisis blows out of proportion in the US or the European Union, the contagion would be in the form of reverse capital flight from Asian financial assets. And that may eventually lead to an Asian currency depreciation uh, that includes Indian rupee, uh, soaring inflation and institutional collapse. Nevertheless, the bulwarks uh, are much stronger this time. So if you compare uh, the current situation with that of uh, the 1996-97 ASEAN crisis, then I doubt whether we will be going on that road uh, uh, given the fact that there are several monetary arrangements such as the Chiang Mai initiative and the BRICS contingency fund that are already in place and maybe deployed in case uh, 1996 type of a, a situation arises. What's your opinion on the conversation around de-dollarization of certain commodities, trade, etc., including possibly in energy? Um, do you think that is something that is on the horizon in the next five years or not really? So I think the USD's uh, universal acceptability as a medium of exchange makes it the de facto reserve currency of the world. Uh, and the actions of the Fed have international ramifications and influence uh, the overall health of the global economy. And I, I think that is something that we have to really understand before we talk about de-dollarization. Time and again, the Fed actions have reminded us that the economic realities of America dictate the health of seemingly disconnected emerging markets in Asia with virtually no skin in the game. Given these realities, uh, it is not nebulous, uh, in my opinion, to understand that a reserve currency that is subjugated to the actions of a particular central bank, in this case, the Fed, can never be the most reliable instrument of exchange and value. Nonetheless, Asian central banks are aware uh, of uh, the USD's preeminent role uh, in trade and currency. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, the USD is kept in reserve to wade through any balance of payment crisis or exchange rate fluctuations. I think that uh, with, a, with a share of uh, almost 45% in the global GDP, uh, Asia has significant exposure to the, to, to the USD. And Asian central banks collectively hold a USD-denominated assets worth nearly $3 trillion. 
so uh, i think it won't be that easy uh, to move away from 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 the usd uh, uh, even though the chinese are trying uh, to to bring in the yuan uh, and to replace the the usd but let's talk a bit about your views on the transition energy transition in india and you know where that stands in terms of investment into that um, from from government budgets and how is india looking today at energy security versus energy transition so india so india is very much concerned about uh, its energy security and i think that is a, one of the uh, major reasons for india going for russian imports uh, despite the global pressure so india's annual refinery capacity is nearly 250 million metric tons uh, at this time uh, and this is the fourth largest refining capacity in the world uh, it is expected to represent 15% of asia's total refining capacity and expected to see fresh capacity creation in the coming years uh, given the 30 billion investment lined up already by indian uh, public sector enterprises as well as certain private enterprises uh, Indian refining capacity grew by almost 33% in 10 years and from roughly 187 million metric tons to 250, as I was mentioning. So India's energy mix is still overwhelmingly based on, on, on crude mm -hmm. uh, 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 as a commodity. Uh, even though uh, about 20% of the installed capacity is now uh, renewable uh, source, uh, but I, I think India would still take a lot of time to transition uh, into uh, uh, into a carbon neutral economy uh, as per India's uh, commitment uh, uh, at, uh, in Paris uh, and, and other and other uh, discussions. Uh, carbon neutrality target has been put uh, uh, put to, to 2060 uh, and that is still yeah. far away. Karan Maharishi, uh monetary economist and author of the India Collective, What India is Really All About. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on Halftime Talk.